night was kind of a crazy night. Uh, as they say, Chris Higgs was uh, dealing with getting his house dried out. No number of other people were having problems he had to deal with. Uh, again, you know, if you have some damage that you need some help with, some trees, things like that, please let us know so that we can uh, maybe get some people over to help you out, uh, get that taken care of. Today we're going to continue our study of uh, Philippians chapter 1. And uh, as we start today, we're going to talk about joy. Well, I want to tell you, after uh, my daughter's sophomore basketball season, sophomore high school basketball season, the coach of her team, uh, at her school, was talking, and uh, he was actually in the, the concession stand. My wife was in there working in the concession stand. He was talking, and, and he was frustrated. And kind of the end of the season, he was frustrated because he recognized it with his team that he had a lot of really good athletes. But what they didn't have were the basketball skills. We had girls that could run really fast, they could jump, they, they, they were great athletes, but they weren't skilled. And in Washington, you don't have an athletics period. And so once the girls finished the basketball season, there was no off-season basketball, so there was no opportunity to really to work on just skill acquisition between that and the next season. And he was talking about it, and he was like, man, I just really wish that I had somebody that that could come up here, you know, and do an open gym on a couple of nights a week and, and be able to work with the girls and, and help them on some of their basketball skills. And, and my wife was listening, and, and she goes, well, Coach, she said, my husband has been saying he wished that he could come up and do that. And uh, he looked at her, and he said, really? She said, yeah. So he called me up and said, you know, hey, Grant, would you be interested in doing this? I said, man, I would love to. Kind of told him. You know, yeah, I played basketball, so look, I'm not a quote coach. I said, I played basketball, so I know how, I know the skills. And I said, I'm going to be loved, be glad to do that. And he said, man, awesome. So we started working, and, and we worked with these girls. And, and what was really interesting with their, the way Washington does their high school sports very different. Um, you're in leagues instead of a district. Basically, it's a district. And the district we were in, had two teams that were in 3A, and the rest were all in 2A. I know that sounds strange that they would do it that way, but that's just the way it was. Well, so for our district, two teams went to the playoffs. We were one of the two 3A teams, and so two 3A teams went to the playoffs. So we started the season knowing that we could go 0-20 and, and make the playoffs. <laughs> the problem was, when you are that bad and you go to the playoffs, you never win a playoff game. Well, these girls have not won a playoff game in like eight years. Every year they would go to the playoffs, and every year they would get beat by 20, 30, 40 points in the playoffs. And so as we started working, we talked about it, and I said, you know, I said, man, next year, that's going to be your goal, to win a playoff game. That's our goal, is to win a playoff game. We worked hard all through that offseason. And I said, and then your goal the next year should be that you win your league, you win your district. We worked hard. They got better. They got better. We went through the season, and you could just tell that they were better than they had been the year before. We get to playoffs. Again, Washington does it different. It's a two-loss playoff system. Uh, and so our first game was against one of the best teams in the state. We got blown out. I mean, it was kind of ugly to play a first playoff game. Fortunately, we have a second one. We go into the second game. It was a team that was actually probably a little bit better than we were. Uh, and these girls worked so hard, they played so hard, and they ended up winning that playoff game. First time they'd won a playoff game in like eight years. Man, we, they were so excited. And I was excited. You know, I'm sitting up in the stands watching them, thinking, I had a part in that. I had a part in them winning, and I was so excited about it. Well, then after the beginning of my senior year, we moved to Sanger. And so Mackenzie did not get to play basketball her senior year there in, at Hazen High School. But we would keep up with them, and, and we'd get uh, emails and messages from the coach as he'd go through the season. Remember we had said, first year the goal was to win a playoff game. Second year the goal was to win their district. The end of the season, they came down, they played one school that it was whoever won the game was going to win the district. And Hayes and girls won the district. And then it was so cool. Even way back here, being able to sit and go, I had a part in that. 
You know, I had a part in those girls getting so much better and, and winning that district title. Man, I was so excited. I mean, I was floating on air 3,000 miles away. I was still just so pumped that I had had a part in these girls winning for the first time, winning. That was the first time in their school history that they had won their league or their district. This past year, this same group of girls have continued to, to be improved. And this past year, those girls went to the state tournament in Washington. And it was exciting, you know what I mean? And, and I, I was so excited about the improvement that they had and, and so excited to see, you know, how they were getting better at basketball. But I want to tell you, we're going to read a passage today that Paul talks about his joy and his excitement for a church. And, and I thought, you know, as excited as I got about these girls winning a basketball league, winning a playoff game, as great as that was, there is something so much more important. Listen to what Paul says in First Corinthians, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for, I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. As Paul writes this letter, he, he, he's talking about his prayers, and, and he says that it is their faith, their faith drove Paul to joy. I meet every month with a group of pastors here in town, and we get together, we spend about 45 minutes just talking and, and sharing and praying together. And what is so interesting is, is watching these pastors as they talk about people within their church and as they talk about people in their church making good decisions and, and growing closer to Christ and, and making changes in their life. I mean, you can just tell that, that there is this incredible joy in their life, that they're so excited about, about what God is doing in the lives of their people. And, you know, and I love when I get to share about somebody in our church and we see a, a growth happen, we just get so excited and it is it's awesome to see pastors getting excited. But then at the same time, there are times where you can tell that our pastors are heartbroken. Because somebody in their church is, is walking away from God. And, and you just see the, the heartbreak in these guys. I'll tell you, Paul experienced the same thing. Paul experienced the, the incredible joy and the incredible heartbreak. In the books of in Corinthians and Galatians especially, Paul calls his readers to task for their sins. And in those books, he, he gets pretty harsh. Uh, he comes down on them pretty hard. And, you know, sometimes we, we read Paul and you read the part like this in Philippians and you think, man, Paul was just this great. You know, everything is great. I'm all happy. Paul can be tough. And in Corinthians and Galatians, he gets tough with his readers. And he's telling those churches, you are wrong, you are doing wrong, and he does not mince any words. It takes him to task. But at the same time, Paul can be effusive in his praise. When, when Paul sees something that is worthy of calling out in a good way, Paul is willing to do it. And, and in this uh, section of Philippians, that's exactly what he's doing. Paul is saying, man, I have seen some things in you that, that makes me so excited. And, and, and he says, I thank God all the time. Every time I pray for you, I stop and I say, thank you, God, for the church at Philippi. So what was it about their life and their faith that drove Paul to joy? Who are we going to talk about the rest of this time? Is what is it about their life? What was it about them? What was it about this church and the people in it that drove Paul to joy? And as we talk about that, I want you to ask yourself, does your life, is it lived out in such a way 
that when I, John, and Ryan, and Chris, when we stop and we pray for you, do we pray with joy? Or do we pray with sadness? Does your life, your walk with Christ, does it drive us to joy? First thing Paul says is their faith was demonstrated in service partnership. They had a partnership with Paul in serving Jesus. That they worked alongside of Paul, working with him throughout so many times. Not just when Paul was there in the, in the city of Philippi, but when Paul was gone on his missionary journeys. There was still a partnership. There was still a working together between the church and Paul. They supported Paul financially. They supported him with prayers, with people throughout his missionary journeys. No matter where Paul went, the church at Philippi was, was making sure that, that they were getting to Paul the support and the help that he needed. You know, as, uh, this past week I had the opportunity to go down to Matamoros, Mexico. Uh, we partnered with a mission organization there called One Mission Ministries. Uh, we got in to begin working with them through the work of, uh, of really, it was Riley Purnell. Um, Riley was, was a major impetus in us working with them. And, and I just got to tell you, this week, I saw how important Riley was to the work in Madame Morris. Uh, everywhere we would go, the missionary named Abraham would introduce me. And, and he would introduce me. He would start off, you know, this is a pastor from North America. And, and you could tell the, the people he was introducing me to, they were kind of like, oh, okay, great, got another preacher down here. But then he would say something. He would stop and he would say, he is Brother Riley's pastor. Didn't even have to say Purnell. He would just say, he's Brother Riley's pastor. And I want to tell you, when he would say that, I felt like the Pope in a Catholic church. <laughs> I mean, I like felt like I could have stuck my hand out and they would have kissed my ring. I, I, I mean, it was like almost bowing down, you know, oh my goodness, you are Riley's pastor. You must be something amazing. And, and I was just sitting there going, wow. All the way through, we would go visit the church. And, and Abraham would point out, he'd say, yeah, your, help, your church helped build this, your church helped build this, helped build this, helped build this. And, and then he would go back and he would go, yeah, your church paid for a lot of this. He would say, but then Riley paid for this, Riley paid for this, Riley paid for this. Over and over, I, I thought, man, Abraham, is there anything around here Riley didn't pay for? Riley had a love for the church, for the work of Madame Morris. And, and he supported it just he's so much better even than we supported it. But we support that work. We help them. Why? Because they're doing some amazing things and they need assistance. And we can partner with them. We have supplies. We have resources that they do not have. And we have shared those resources with them. And it's been an incredible experience. And I just got to tell you, we're going to try to be putting together a trip down there in October. I encourage you to go. Uh, it's going to be uh, primarily a medical mission trip. Richard Escobedo is going to be working on getting that put together. Now, I want to encourage you to go. You may say, I don't know what I can do on a medical mission trip. Trust me, there will be stuff that you can do. Go be a part of it. It's us partnering just as the church of Philippi partnered with Paul, it is us partnering with Abraham, doing work. It's what we're supposed to do. What drives us to do that? It should be our faith. The partnership that they had in the church of Philippi and Paul, we should have that, not just with the mission group in, in Matamoros, Mexico, but here within our own church. We're going to meet later in the book of Philippians, we're going to meet a man named Epaphroditus. And uh, Paul talks about how the church had sent him. He was probably one of the major leaders in the church in Philippi. But the church decided, they were so excited about what Paul was doing, and they were so concerned with Paul, that they sent Epaphroditus, they sent him off, and they said, go join Paul, go help take care of Paul. He brought, probably brought with him a, a financial gift to sustain Paul. But here was a church who was saying, we've got a great leader here that we're going to send off just to help Paul. It was a partnership where they said, we are willing to sacrifice to benefit somebody else. Folks, we need to be that same way. I want to ask you this. Have you partnered 
with this church in service to our Savior. And I don't mean just being a member. We have a lot of members. Or we have members that we probably couldn't even find anymore. That's, being a member, it's important. But what Paul is talking about, what I want you to understand about this partnership, it's so much more than just signing your name on a, on a piece of paper and saying, now I'm a member of First Baptist. I want to ask if you truly partnered with us. Have you been willing to sacrifice for the benefit of the church? That's what it's about. It's not, it's not about saying I'm a member, but it is about being willing to give up for the greater good. That's what God calls us to, and that's what Paul is saying to the church of Philippi. He's saying, your joy, your partnership with us your partnership, you're working alongside, you're sacrificing for, for the work that I'm doing brings joy to my life and to my heart. He also said that their faith being completed by God brings joy to their heart. Paul uses an interesting phrase in verse 6. He says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul's confidence rests in God, not in the church of Philippi. As excited and as happy as he is about all the things that the partnership that Philippi has had with him, it's not the church, but it's his confidence rests in God. He says, it is God who began a good work in you. When did God begin a good work in them? Long before Paul ever visited the city of Philippi. You see, God planned salvation from the beginning of the world. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. It tells us that, that God had a plan for salvation of mankind from the very beginning. Jesus' death on a cross was not God's plan B. It wasn't something that when Adam and Eve sinned, that God said, oh gosh, I've got to come up with something, I've got to come up with some way to, to bring salvation and to bring a restoration of the relationship between, between me and mankind. I've got to do something and then figure out, oh, here's what we can do. No, it was God's plan from the very beginning. He loved us enough. He was willing to do that from the very beginning. He started salvation before the creation of the world. That same God who began that work way before, even while you and I were, were the enemies of God, separated from Him, God loved you enough that He began to begin a work in you. That He began to, to draw you to Himself. We don't just wake up one day and all of a sudden our own desires decide, I want to be saved today. We become followers of Jesus because the Spirit of God begins to work in us, begins to tug us, begins to pull us, begins to, to convict us of our sin, begins to, to make us understand that, that the way we're living our life is not right, that, that we need something happening, we need something to happen in our life. The Spirit begins to do that long before, maybe even before you ever set foot in a church. God begins to just work in you. He begins that work. And he, the Bible says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion the day of Christ Jesus. That carry it on to completion. That is what theologians call the second stage of salvation. The first stage of salvation is when we recognize that we are a sinner. When we ask Jesus to come into our life to forgive us of our sins and, and to create in us a new person. That's the first stage of salvation. It's called justification. The second stage of salvation is a process that begins right then. And it goes until the day you breathe your last on this earth or when Jesus comes back. And it is a process that is called sanctification. With justification, our only part in that is saying yes. God offers the plan of the gift of salvation to us, and we say yes, thank you. That's the only part we have in justification. You and I can't do it. Uh, we are sinners, 
Uh, there is a wall that we cannot cross. We cannot get through. There is no way to get past it. There is no way for you and I to, to be good enough, to work hard enough to get to God. The only way for that to happen is for God to knock down the wall and clear a path. And He does that in Jesus Christ and His death on that cross. Jesus knocks the wall down and clears a path. And all we have to do in justification is say yes. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. But once we've done that, we get a process of sanctification. And that's what Paul is talking about. If God began a good work in you, He will carry it on. When he, as God carries on that work, you and I now have a part in it. It's part of sanctification. It is us learning what it means to be a follower of Christ. Us working together to, to make the choices that will help us to be, uh, to be a better follower of Jesus. Getting the knowledge that we need. Putting all those things into place. That's sanctification. Sunday nights in the fall and spring, we have a program here called Build. A Build is, is a number of different classes. Uh, we've kind of got it narrowed down to, to seven core foundational classes that, that we just want to encourage everybody to go through. Everybody to take those and, and to have a, a base, kind of solid foundation of what it means to be a believer, what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to be a member of the church. It te teaches you how to talk about learning how to pray. And if I talk about learning how to read our scriptures, how to share our faith, those build classes, if you remember the logo that we had, it's three blocks that are all together, and then it's another block that's being set into place. I love the, the, I love the symbolism of that. Those three blocks, it's a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That fourth block being put in, I think that is us. That's each one of us being put into our place, working with God to make us be what He wants us to be. I want to encourage you, man, when we start back up to build in the fall, be a part of it. Learn how God can bring you along and build you to completion. That word completion can also be translated perfection. You see, our goal is to be perfect. To be completely without sin. As long as we live in this world, we will never get to that place where we are absolutely, completely without sin. That old nature is going to be at war with us. And even though it's a goal that, that we're never going to attain, we keep working at it. And we keep getting better and better. God wants to work in your life. And you can do it on your own. You know, some people say, well, I don't need the church. I, I can go and, and I can learn and, and, and I can do this on my own. Reality is, you really can't. You might think you can. And you might go for a little bit, but do it okay. Folks, you need the church. Just as the church needs you, and needs your service, your work, you need the church. You need a group that can come alongside you, that can help you out when you get down, that can comfort you when you're grieving. But you also need the church that can come alongside you when you're messing up, give you a kick in the seat of the pants, and say, hey, Get your life together. That's the way we need to be. We need to be a people that when things are good, we give a hug and a slap on the back and say, man, that's awesome. We need to be a people that also when things are bad, maybe they're bad because bad things have happened to us, we need a, the group that can come alongside you and give you a hug and have a shoulder to lean on. But we also need a group of people that can come alongside you and say, hey, knock it off. Quit doing this. You're not walking in God's path right now. Paul says to the church in Philippi, you bring joy to my heart. 
Now, was the church in Philippi perfect? Nope, it wasn't. How can we know that? Pretty simply, we know because there were humans in it. And as long as you have human beings in any group, it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> but he tells us in Philip and the Philippians, there are some places where he hints at some problems in the church. I will tell you this. First Baptist Singer, we're not perfect. If you think we're perfect, I'm sorry, but we're not. We're not perfect. Why? Because we're human. But we want to be better. The last thing he talks to the church about, he talks about how their faith grew deeper in life. So one of the things that brings me joy is that your faith is growing deeper. But it's interesting. He doesn't just stop. He doesn't just say that your faith is growing deeper. Paul's not saying that, man, y'all all have a master's of divinity. You know, you've all been to seminary and you've got all of the Bible knowledge. He says, no, it's not just knowledge. He says, it's the love. But he says, as the love of God builds in your life, as the love for God, as the love for people, both believers and non-believers, he says, as that builds up, it builds up in love, but it brings with it knowledge and understanding and deeper insight. Folks, it doesn't matter how much Bible knowledge you have. Paul tells us in Corinthians, without all of those things are great, but without love, it's just a clinging symbol. If you want your love to be where it is, if you want your life to be one that brings joy to your pastors, and more importantly, that brings joy to God, then yes, you do need to grow deeper. You do need to grow in your understanding. You need to grow in, in your knowledge of what this book says. But you also need to grow deeper in love. In love for God, in love for His people, and also a love for those who are outside of His family right now. We need to have a love. It's a continual growth. It's a development. It's, it's a sense of caring more for others and caring more about others than I do about myself. Our world says the opposite. Our world says, oh, you know, you gotta, you got to take care of yourself. Uh, our world says you've you got to love yourself more than anybody else. And it's wrong. That mentality creates so many of the problems that we face as a society. The answer is not loving myself more. The answer is loving God, loving His people, and loving those who don't know Him yet. And demonstrating that love through the work that we do. I ask you once again, have you partnered with God? Have you partnered with Jesus Christ? Have you partnered with God to experience salvation and to begin working on yourself to make you what He wants you to be? And then have you partnered with the church that can work with God to help you grow and be what, you, what He wants you to be? If you haven't done that, I want to invite you today if you haven't taken that first step and, and gotten right with God and been forgiven of your sins and begun to experience His work in your life to, to make you to be what He wants you to be, then, then I want to invite you in just a minute as we are down here, as we're going to sing. Uh, John and I will be standing here. I want to invite you to come uh, to, to give your life to Christ. Some of you may be here and you may have already made that decision. You've already become a believer. The next step for you is to say, I want to be a part of the church. We'll be part of this church. I want to partner with First Baptist Singer to be the kind of person that God really wants me to be. And I want to invite you to come join with us, officially become part of our family, be in partnership with us and God to work in your life and to work in the lives of the people of this community. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege that it is to worship you. Father, I pray that right now, if there are any here that haven't made that decision to become a part of your family, 
Uh, Father, there are some that have not made that decision to give their life to you, to be forgiven of their sins, and to begin that process of you making them into what you want them to be. And Lord, I pray today that they would make that choice. But Father, there may be others here today that, that are already believers that need to take that next step so that they formally bond and unite with this church. And Lord, I pray that if that is the case, that they'd say yes today and become part of this family. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Let's stand and come as we sing. John and I will be here.